All right, guys, welcome on back. Locked on Syracuse podcast, Thursday edition. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. It is Tim Leonard going to chat it up with Stephen Bailey again today, part two of our conversation, diving into everything Syracuse football right now. Fresh off the spring game, we get into where the position battles stand at the wide receiver position, offensive line today as well as the defense and the shaky defensive line, what Steven makes of who is standing out on the defensive line so far, any young players that might be turning heads here in camp and in the spring game, and we could see breakout this season. We'll dive into that, and we will start our conversation talking about the offense and what to expect run pass split wise in the offense coming up this season for Syracuse. So lots to dig into with Stephen Bailey. If you missed part one, go back and check that out yesterday. It is part two of our conversation on our spring game takeaways coming up on the Locked On Syracuse podcast. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On the note of the new offense, and I know it was a spring game, and you probably can't take too much from it, but was there anything that surprised you about how Robert and I and, and Jason Beck and this new offense looked and how plays were called? And just in general, what are your thoughts on how this offense is going to be called compared to what we saw last year, maybe? Yeah, both good questions. Um, I wouldn't say I took a ton away from the spring game. They kept it pretty vanilla. Uh, we have seen, I would say, more variation in formation and personnel through the practices this spring, right? I mean, okay. we've seen them go empty. We've seen them go 22, two backs, two tight ends. We've seen guys putting their hands down in the backfield. We've seen slot receivers in the backfield. Um, we've seen wide receivers lining up in line just off the tackle. You know, we've seen twins. We've seen trips. We've seen... I don't know if we've seen we've seen four guys on one side and diamond or whatever they call it, but we've we have we have seen tons and tons of formations just in a very limited period of time. Um, so they're trying to put in as much as they can and evaluate as many players as they can. And then my expectation is when it gets to the fall, you know, you try and narrow it down based on the game plan, based on the matchups you want to exploit. Um, so I think the the consistent thing that carries over there, I would say is the versatility um, and the pre-snap motion. I think they, there's a lot more of that, different kinds of motions, like straight coming across the formation. We saw quarterbacks working a drill where you'd bring a receiver across and hit a quick ball to the flat, like kind of a classic third and short call. If you're just trying to, you know, a team's got a stacked box, all right, like make sure that, you know, I guess whoever it is, the outside linebacker or the safety it isn't just crashing is, is going to stick with it. You know, the, the motioning receiver we've seen orbit motions where guys will go behind the backfield. We've seen, you know, in and then out, we've seen way more than we ever saw, you know, previously. So I think that window dressing um, is consistent and regardless of which chunk of the playbook they pick for a game, you're going to see that they, they are, trying to be deceptive they're trying to keep defenses off balance now obviously you need to produce for that actually to work but mm -hmm. um you know i would say those are generally my takeaways and just talking to the players like they're putting in a new script every day like they're hammering as many plays and formations in as they possibly can uh and you know to me it's going to be about well well how much can the players take in and then can they build individual game plans or, around that if there's guys they're trying to exploit, you know, matchups they like, uh, a strength that they kind of find, um, you know, and that, I mean that's that's kind of the sport. You're you're always kind of hunting matchups like that, especially in the box. Um, well, when you can't throw the ball downfield, that's kind of yeah. that's kind of what that's kind of what you're <laughs> limited to. But uh, by and large, you know, they didn't show they didn't show us a ton as you would kind of expect, and uh, you know, I'll I'll definitely be looking forward to the fall where we we see a little bit more and. Um, uh, some some uh, some more trick plays. Feels like we saw a little bit more of that. Yeah. We saw, you know, Philly special and like a reverse flea flicker in the in the spring game. So, um, 
you know, I think these are these are coaches who are willing to be a little looser with uh, with how they do those things. Maybe they'll yeah, even throw know. the ball on first down. Right. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> I don't know what to make of the trick play stuff. I guess it's just probably we'll wait and see because I feel like when Dino first came, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it, maybe you remember it differently, but maybe it's just like the Virginia Tech game is fresh in my mind, the win in the Dome where there was a trick right. play. And it did feel like, though, he was more willing to do some of that stuff, and that's kind of died down recently. And I don't know if that is – when Gilbert came in and, you know, you're dealing with COVID and incorporating the new game plan. It is nice this year that at least there's a somewhat normal spring and a spring game and scrimmages and just more of a normal sort of off season to incorporate a new offensive system, because I know that was something that probably cost Syracuse in that COVID time period. Yeah, that definitely hurt them. Um, you know, as far as the trick plays, I think a lot of it's just like, putting yourselves in the right situation to do that, like getting to midfield, getting to second and short where you kind of have that element of surprise, trusting your offensive line to hold up for more than a couple of seconds. So you can point. Yeah. <laughs> pitch the ball to a couple of guys and someone can get downfield. Like, yep. uh, so, you know, and then I, you do that for a while. It's probably easy to get stuck into uh, limited, limited play calling. So right. I don't know how much of it's situation and how much of it's like the coaches, but I do think we'll see that open up a little bit this year, especially if the offensive line can generate a little bit more time for the passing game. Yeah. All right. Another pretty much impossible question for you here because we're Perfect. so far out, but <laughs> I'll shoot anyway. The everyone's, this is what everyone's wondering probably is how much is this offense going to be run heavy and how much is it going to be, more passes and I guess that's dependent on Garrett Schrader but just looking at what Virginia did last year they didn't run the ball I think they ran the ball the fewest of any team in the ACC and they passed the ball the most of any team in the ACC Syracuse was the exact opposite yeah so what is your best guess right now on what we will see play calling wise in terms of a run pass split yeah somewhere in the middle they definitely won't be the most passing yeah. heavy team in the ACC with with Garrett Schrader and Sean Tucker, right. uh, it's probably probably somewhere in the middle. Like, I mean, here's the thing: if they can run the ball really, really well, then they'll keep running the ball, right? I mean, um, the you know the question is whether the passing game will be good enough to to keep teams from just totally stacking the box, right? Can they win against man coverage? That's it. Can you win against man coverage? If you can do that, then you'll be a balanced offense. If your young receivers can figure out how to create separation, if you can get the timing on the rub routes down, the crossing routes, you know, the, you know, you incorporate the tight ends and again, the motions with things like that. If you can isolate defenders like that all helps in those situations. But if you can win one-on-one, -on -one, you prevent teams from just saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to put people in the box to account for Tucker and Schrader. And we got another guy to help if, if we need to, you know, so ultimately my guess is they will be, Pretty balanced, probably a little more run heavy than most teams in the conference, but that's because they've got one of the best running backs in the country. Um, but I'm interested just like you are. I, I think everything I've I've kind of read up on on Robert and I and Jason and, and Jason Beck, I guess to a lesser extent, is they play to their strengths. You've got yeah. a really good you've got a really good running back. Um, <clears throat> you know, you don't have a wide receiver who's established as the number one guy. I think they've got some interesting players, uh, but there's no one who it's like, oh, wow, like, you know, this guy can win. This guy can win against anybody, you know, even like Taj, you know, I, I gosh, I thought Taj in the slot was going to work out so well. And it didn't, it didn't. And I, you know, I still think they didn't really ever fully commit to that. You know, the, the, the DeVito Harris, you know, passing game that I thought could have been pretty good last year. They never really, they never, you know, they bailed on it early, I guess would, would be a way to say. And, and, you know, ultimately maybe that was the right call. The middle of the season went well. Um, but I do think, so next year, I think you're going to see more balance. I think they're probably going to run the ball until they can't. Uh, and then if they can, if they can win against, you know, man coverage, then you should be able to score some points and move the ball. On the note of the wide receivers, you bring them up there and how there's probably not a clear-cut number one right now. What's your best guess on how the depth chart at wide receiver is shaking out, and is there anyone that's impressed you from what you've seen in practices or in the spring game? 
Yeah, it is so convoluted. <laughs> it's like, you know, there were like ten di- guys that caught a pass the other night too. I yeah, think. yeah. Like yeah I mean, I mean, they've legitimately rotated reps for a bunch of guys throughout the spring, and you'll see a guy make a play here, a play there, but you know, in their defense, because they're not getting consistent reps, how are they supposed to produce consistently? Mm-hmm. Like, it's like we want to get kind of the staff wants to get an evaluation of everybody. It really makes it hard for someone to create separation. It's like you got to maximize every little opportunity. So <clears throat> I'll say this, like, you know, I, I, I think Courtney Jackson is a guy who will be on the field and he played yeah. a lot last year as the primary slot receiver. He got a little better after the catch. Um, I think he's someone who is reliable and, and has the potential to be dynamic. Um, on the outside, Damian Alford would probably be my top guess for a guy who's going to play because he's long. He can stretch the field. He's got a big catch radius. Again, you know, who can win in man coverage? You know, a guy like that naturally creates some space and he's explosive. He can get behind the defense. That said, neither of those guys is like lighting the world on fire. You look at the slot room and Devon Cooper and Trevor Pena are both very good players. I mean, Devon Cooper's really good in short spaces. I mean, he's been you know, he, he's had some really nifty moves in practice, creating separation from defenders. And then Trevor Pena is electric. I mean, he's their top return man. He's someone who I could see moving around the offense to a bunch of different places, the way, you know, and, and I utilized some guys at Virginia last year as kind of more quote unquote football players. And you find <clears throat> different ways to incorporate them in spaces on the field where they'll, they'll excel. So you got three good slot receivers there. Um, mm-hmm. And then on the outside, I mean, there's tons of guys. We've, we've all seen what Anthony Queeley can do, a solid possession receiver. And one of the best run blockers, you know, I think about the, the football, you know, Syracuse football receivers I've covered. Steve Ishmael is a heck of a run blocker. I would put Anthony Queeley pretty much right there. I mean, you go back, you go back last year, they ran toward Anthony Queeley a lot. <laughs> like Sean Tucker ran past Anthony Queeley, sealing a cornerback many, many times last year. So, you know, that's, that's someone who is, maybe not going to be explosive in the receiving game, but is, is valuable depending on the the game plan you're taking into a certain matchup. Like if you think you're going to pound the rock, Queeley's probably going to be on the field. Uh, I would say the two guys who impressed me the most this spring are second year receivers who I didn't really get to see at all last year. Aronde Gadsden, the second who was on the verge of kind of playing last year, big bodied guy who strikes me as someone who can kind of do it all. You know, he can create separation. He's rangy. He can get over the top crossing routes. You know, we've seen him catch a couple tunnel screens, you know, possession guy. Like he's kind of got the potential to be a, a full, you know, full style receiver. And then Umari Hatcher, another second year guy, a little more slender, really fast, great body control, um, good instincts. You know, I, I'll be interested to see how well he kind of gets off the line against good coverage. but. You know, working against Garrett Williams and Deuce, Deuce Chestnut has certainly given him a solid look this spring. So I, I still think you're going to see a lot of guys get looks in the fall, including Michigan State transfer C.J. Hayes. Um, but ultimately, the reps are going to have to have to get cut down. And I will be really curious to see, like, who is and isn't getting reps because it's <clears throat> it is not a lot of really guys. clear at all. Yeah, there's a ton of guys in there and there's not much separation. Okay, quick break from Stephen Bailey. Our next partner has a product I use literally every single day, and that is Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 because I kind of just wanted to hear what all the fuss was about, and I wanted to have more energy throughout the day. Now I've been taking it for a couple months, and I can honestly say I love it. It does not taste like it's super healthy. It has kind of a mild tropical taste that I actually look forward to each and every morning. It is basically one delicious scoop each morning that you take and you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and more to help you start your day right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All of those things just by taking a little scoop each and every morning. I can honestly say it's made me just feel more refreshed throughout the day. Helped me get through that kind of low in the afternoon when you start to feel tired, especially after a tough night's sleep. This has been huge for that. It supports better sleep quality and recovery, supports mental clarity and alertness. And it's the one thing with the best things that is Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iterations and third party testing. It costs not that much too. You're less than $3 a day 
You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. So it'll really help you just stay refreshed throughout the day, but in a healthy manner as well. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash college. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash college to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. What about offensive line? That's the other question mark, I would say, on the offense at least. And it feels like it's been a question mark for a number of years here. Let's start out with this actually first. Is there any reason to think that someone might be added on the offensive line? It seems like they're still pretty aggressive in the transfer portal, relatively speaking. What is your general thought on will they add someone before we get to the fall in terms of an import on the offensive line? My general thought is yes. Okay. <laughs> they, yeah. They real. Yeah. I mean, I think as long as they can find someone who they think can come in and compete for a starting job, like you got to do it. I mean, the last three years have been rough. L last year, not quite as much as the previous two, but would you rather but burn also, the extra I wonder, scholarship? Not to cut you off, but I no, feel like. Was last year that much better, or was it just Garrett Schrader was in a position to sort of mask the offensive line a little bit more? I think statistically it would say there was improvement, but there there were better I, run blockers for sure. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, you, for you sure. can't they were have better run one of the blockers. best rushers in the country without some improvement there. So and Chris now Blige it becomes is a big part of that. Yeah, now it becomes pass protection. I think would be the question mark more so. A hundred percent. It's been a really bad pass protecting unit the last three years. They were not much better last year aside from Matthew Bergeron I mean yeah. Matthew Bergeron is is great he's like a top 15 pass protecting tackle last year on PFF something something like that like sure. very very good he is not at all the problem he's I talked to him earlier this spring he was like I really want to work on my run blocking I was like you guys like paved the way for like a record-setting season last year he's like yeah but like <laughs> that's the weak point in my game and I was like it's just so ironic like you've got this elite pass protector with like a group that just has struggled mightily otherwise so yeah they needed they need to get better in pass pro i think they'll be a good run blocking unit again if if chris blight who's had another hip surgery is healthy everyone is saying that you know dino babers included and i believe chris posted something similar at some point that he's he's feeling the best he has he's pain free if that's the case you have him and dakota davis as your two guards Great pairing there. You've got Bergeron at left tackle. Then the question is, what are you doing about center and right tackle? I would guess the fourth lineman right now is Carlos Vettorello, a veteran who has played both of those positions and I thought looked pretty good at right tackle for the first chunk of spring. Uh, the issue is he got moved to center about a week ago because they are struggling to find a center. Josh Eloa and Wes Hoa both worked in there. Um, now Veterello is getting a turn there. So I think you either got to pull someone kind of from the underbelly of that group to play center or right tackle. Maybe that's Darius Tisdale who, who really, really did struggle last year. Um, you know, and he came back from an injury. So you don't know how much of that was him being physically limited, but from a pass pro standpoint, I mean, it was, it was really bad. Um, so maybe you find a center or right tackle within the roster and you put Veterell at the other spot, I think more likely you go out and get a transfer to at least enhance that competition and see if maybe you can get a guy, a tackle like Anthony Red or Enrique Cruz or Tyler Magnuson to, to develop quickly enough to compete for a job or, you know, or you push a who I, who I think is probably the most prepared at one of those positions to, uh, to, I guess, start. But learning a new offense is brutal for a young center who hasn't doesn't have a ton of game experience. Um, the, the last person I would mention is Kalen Ellis, who started, I think, five games last year. 388-pound yeah. dude. I don't know if he plays a position besides guard. Like, I don't know if you can mm -hmm. put him, Bleich, or Dakota Davis. I mean, Dakota played a little bit of right tackle last year. I don't know if he's good enough at that, if he has the mobility – to for that to really make sense or you've just got like three great guards and no center or right tackle which is kind of what it feels like to me right now but maybe there's some kind of positional flexibility thing that they, they find a way to, to get all three of those guys in the field because i mean i think kalen ellis is good he was working with the first team offense for most of the spring while Blight is rehabbing his his injury um 
So, yeah, I, I think there's potential with that group, but I, I think adding another scholarship guy, particularly someone who can play center or right tackle, makes a lot of sense. You'd, you'd rather burn an extra scholarship on an offensive lineman you didn't need than run into the same problem that keeps happening where you're playing guys who aren't ready, you can't run your offense, teams are stacking the box, the defense is on the field forever, and no one wants to watch the game couple more things to get to with Stephen Bailey. Before we do that, betonline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, including this week's Masters Championship, underway today. You can check out live odds, podcast, and reviews for the Masters in all different leagues this season over at BetOnline. It is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. They have everything over there. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. I mean, we're not that far removed from Chris Elmore having to be on the offensive line. So hopefully you could have to play, you could have to play defensive line this year. Yes, I, let, let's get to that. That's where I'm gonna go. <laughs> defensive line, you know, it's funny because I feel good about the defense, and there's a lot of reasons to feel good about the defense. But then every time I read the defensive line, I feel like it gets worse and worse. Like every time I go back to it, I'm like, man, there is really just not a lot of bodies there that we know anything about. So is there any optimism from what you've seen in the spring on maybe a guy stepping up that is under the radar right now? Or where do you see sort of the defensive line battle shaking out? Well, there's always optimism in the spring. Well, that's true. Optimism yes. <laughs> optimism lives in the spring. You know, Mike, Michael Jones said he doesn't think there'll be a drop off. Right. Uh, and, you know, I get it. You're you're the defensive leader and you're in that locker room and you see the young guys working and and you're a part of that. So, you know, no knock on them. But the drop off from the group they had last year to the one they have this year is significant in both experience and size. I mean, you've got three scholarship guys coming back who've played college ball. None of them took more than 250 snaps last year. That's Caleb Okachukwu, Terry Lockett, and Steve Linton. Um, I would say all three of those guys are on the smaller side. And Terry Lockett's a second-year defensive tackle who didn't have a redshirt year. He played last year. Yeah. So he's someone who's going to gradually grow in. Um, but you look at Steve Linton, like he's playing at like 220 pounds right now. I mean, he's – you know, he said – I'll have a story out on him sometime in the next week or two, but I, I spoke with him during the spring and he said, oh, I want to get up to 240. Uh, you know, okay, like I get it. Like I get why you want to add weight, but <laughs> 240 at defensive end is still pretty light. Like what happens when an offensive tackle gets their hands on you on a run play? You're only going one one way. Yeah. Um, and if you have, you know, you kind of have those issues, well, then your linebackers don't have lanes to fill. And instead of second and eight, you're looking at second and four. And you can't be aggressive because, you know, you're more susceptible to giving something an explosive play up, right? So there are serious questions with the defensive line. Of course, there are young guys who look good. You know, Jatias Gear, um, redshirt freshman, moves really, really well. Uh, Elijah Fuentes Cundiff, Chase Simmons, also second year guys who redshirted last year, who know the system, who are getting second team reps. Uh, a couple of early enrollees, Dennis Jacques, especially, I think has looked good. And Francois Nolton, we saw him get a sack and a forced fumble uh, in the spring game. So, yeah, I mean, they, I think they've got some promising young guys. The problem is they're still young and they don't have enough older bodies to really bridge that gap from McKinley Williams and Kingsley, Kingsley Jonathan and Curtis Harper and Cody Roscoe and Josh Black. Like you had five like fifth year or older guys last year on the defensive line. Now you've got, three guys who played, you know, in contributing roles last year. So they're, they're absolutely going to hit the transfer portal for at least one defensive lineman. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've got huge questions and it, you know, if they can't put together a, a good group up there, it's kind of a shame because this is as, as good of a back eight as I can remember covering here. I mean, that, that linebacker unit is, is probably right up there with like Zaire Franklin, Paris Bennett and Jonathan Thomas, as, as far as, as far as trios I've covered in like the last 10 years, I mean, they, they do it all great tacklers, pretty good cover guys. I mean, Mikel Jones is everywhere on the field. Um, maybe the best corner, one of the best cornerback duos, you know, I can't say maybe, but, you know, with between iffy and uh, I would say probably iffy and um, shoot, who was before him? And uh, Chris Frederick was a good one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, excellent. Certainly an excellent cornerback duo in, in Deuce 
and Deuce and Garrett Williams. And you got all your safeties back pretty much. The only guy you lose from the secondary who played much last year was Adrian Cole. You got all your safeties back. You had Elijah Clark from Rutgers, Braylon Oliver from Louisville. Like the back eight is set. But mm-hmm. how much <laughs> you know, how much can they do if, if you, you can't stop the run up front? It's it's a really, really interesting defense. And, uh, you know, t- I think Tony White's got his work cut out. But if he can get that line to play well, they could have one of the better defenses in the ACC. Yeah. It almost feels like if they were an NFL team, they would, like, trade a, a safety for a defensive lineman. Oh, 100%. Or, offensive lineman. Yeah. or a just... running back. They've got three good running backs. I was yeah, like, right. It's like, great, your third running back looks great. What are you going to do, play three running backs? You've got an All-American running back. Yeah, that's that's right. When Dino brought up in one of the pressers, and I'm sure you were there about LaQuinn Allen, I was like, that's great, but can you tell me about a wide receiver that's looking really good? Because yeah. that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, before we get out of here, just – Anyone else on the defense? I know Oliver was getting a lot of praise in the spring game. And, you know, there are some newcomers back there. But is there anyone defensively that you've seen in the spring could even be offensively, too, that you just think we have a mention and and they could be a breakout player or they've exceeded expectations so far? Mm, You know, there's no one that that really comes to mind. I mean, you know who the guys are going to be at linebacker. And you know yeah. they're pretty much going to be in the secondary. I, I don't know how much Braylon Oliver will see. Um, I think he's got tons of range. I think he's someone who has a huge ceiling and in a couple of years could be, you know, a potentially an all ACC caliber player. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'll see. He's working at Rover, so he'll be competing with Rob Hanna and Justin Barron, two guys who have multiple years of, of playing in the system. The last name I'll highlight, and it's not someone who I think will be a breakout player, but it's someone who could be really important if – a linebacker gets hurt is Derek McDonald. He is a second year redshirt freshman who is right now linebacker, seemingly linebacker number four. I don't think he's like locked in that role or anything, but we did see him mix in with the ones during the spring game. I think they're trying to evaluate him. They're trying to see what he does. Um, He plays the weak side, mostly behind Marlo wax, kind of a big body. who can move around, get in the backfield, cause some problems, but also, also cover the flat if needed. Um, You know, the, he's someone who could end up being a core special teamer. And if one of those guys goes out in every down guy, right. You think about Jeff Canton Arku and how important he was last year and in the year before that. <clears throat> now he went to Memphis because he wasn't going to start. Mm-hmm. Um, at least, at least that's my yeah. understanding, you know, not to put words in his mouth and I'm, it's hard to blame him because he's behind three excellent linebackers at Syracuse. But if one of those guys gets hurt, you know, you can't have a weak link there, especially behind a defensive line like that. So Derek McDonald could end up being an important player in the fall if Marlo Wax or Stephon Thompson or Mikel Jones needs to miss a week. Yeah. All right. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for hopping on. Really enjoy reading your stuff throughout this time of the year and football season. I'd encourage everyone to go check out his work, Cuse Nation, 247sports.com. Follow him on Twitter as well, and hopefully we'll catch up down the road. Yeah, sounds great, man. Thanks so much for having me on. Okay, that's going to wrap things up with Stephen Bailey. Thanks for checking out today's podcast. If you missed yesterday, part one, be sure to do that. Great chatting with Stephen, getting the lowdown on all things Syracuse football and this spring optimism season. He's always a great guy to talk to and get his perspective on things. Really, no one covers Syracuse football better than Stephen Bailey over at 247sports.com. Tomorrow on the show, some reports of Quincy Ballard taking a visit. Some other guys have leaked out in the transfer portal. We will discuss, should Syracuse add someone in the transfer portal, what to make of Quincy Ballard potentially becoming that addition in the transfer portal. Is that enough? Is it lazy? Is it a good thing? What do we make of the idea that Quincy Ballard might be the backup center next year? Could that mean man-to-man? Could that mean 2 3 Lots to get into on that front, so we'll discuss that in any other news that comes out. Subscribe to the show if you haven't already. You can also watch each and every episode on YouTube, so subscribe to the YouTube page there, and we will talk to you guys tomorrow on the pod.